Hello and welcome back. In our last unit, we examined the revolutions in France and the Americas that shook the foundations of European society to its core, starting from a single premise, the notion that all men are created equal. The concept of equality thus became a cornerstone of modern political theory, along with the notions of natural right, popular sovereignty, and rejection of absolutist rule. As thinkers such as Locke and Jefferson, Voltaire and Rousseau, asserted the freedom and equality of humanity in its natural state, they created a de facto challenge to the absolutist regimes that had dominated European politics for centuries. By undermining, at least conceptually, the foundations of monarchical rule, these men made several questions inevitable. What is the role of government? Who should rule? And how should a government unite its peoples? Prior to the Atlantic Revolutions, these matters had been decided largely by hereditary rulers. But after the revolutions, groups traditionally excluded from participating in government laid claim to the natural rights and political protections that an implied social contract was believed to guarantee. But the exercise of those rights required new political paradigms. Certainly, the execution of the King of France, Louis XVI, in 1793, announced a new age by proving that no ruler was unanswerable to his people, and by symbolizing, for many, the end of absolute monarchy and the birth of a new French national identity. The death of Louis also raised some vexing questions. Without a king, how could there be a kingdom? And if there was no kingdom, what should there be? This week, we'll examine the ideologies that emerged in the 19th century to answer these questions, specifically the ideologies of liberalism, conservatism, and nationalism. Let's begin by clarifying the concept of ideology, by which we'll designate a system of beliefs or theories, often political, held by an individual or a group and used to justify its actions. Liberalism fits this definition. Its philosophical provenance can be traced to John Locke. As we noted in a previous lecture, Locke reasoned that each man has a natural right to life, liberty, and property, and that an implicit social contract obligates the government to recognize those rights. Both the United States Constitution and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizens are founded on the principle of protecting an individual's rights. So it's not surprising that liberal thinkers supported both the American Revolution and the early stages of the French Revolution, although liberal support for the latter waned markedly once the Jacobins, the most radical of the French revolutionaries, instituted the infamous reign of terror under the direction of Robespierre, who was later guillotined for its excesses. It's important to note that most classic liberal thinkers also did not believe in a complete restructuring of society. That would be the mission of the socialists who emerged later in the 1800s. But liberal thinkers also opposed traditional conservatism, seeking instead to replace absolutism in government with representative democracy and the rule of law. Perhaps the most mature expression of 19th century liberalism was formulated by the English philosopher John Stuart Mill in his book On Liberty, published in 1859, 70 years after the onset of the French Revolution. For Mill, social tyranny represented as much of a danger to human freedom as governmental or civil tyranny, and he borrowed de Tocqueville's phrase, tyranny of the majority, to describe it. To protect an individual's liberty from majority pressures, Mill proposed the following rule, namely, that the only circumstance under which a society can forcibly restrict the freedom of one of its members is to prevent harm to other members of the society. In other words, society may curtail any behavior that harms others, but may suppress nothing else. As far as possible, society should seek to preserve individual liberties since free choice and action is necessary to ensure progress within the society as a whole. We can detect in this formulation some of the concerns that modern libertarians have voiced regarding their freedom to act as they choose. Conservatism, the next ideology we'll examine, was a direct reaction to liberalism. The most eloquent and influential of the early conservatives was an Irish statesman, 
Edmund Burke. In his Reflections on the French Revolution, 1790, the date of publication, Burke expressed profound skepticism about both the French Revolution and liberal ideology. Burke distrusted any kind of rapid change, any kind of revolutionary overturning of existing things. He was not opposed to change as such, but he favored change that we would now consider to be organic, change that came slowly from inside a society that properly respected tradition. While he rejected unrestrained royal power, Burke was a firm believer in constitutional monarchy. Conservatives often quoted him when defending traditional approaches to government throughout the 19th century and when repudiating any, any notions of natural right or social contract. We've left the third ideology, nationalism, for last because of its deep and often disturbing impact on the modern world. Nationalism today remains the most powerful of ideologies. Let's start again with a definition. Nationalism is the belief that a people who are significantly united by language, history, custom, or ethnicity should have their own territory, their own state. No nation should be ruled by any other nation or by any other people. The modern idea of the nation state comes directly from this potent combination of beliefs. In many ways, nationalism was born of the French Revolution. It surfaced notably when French soldiers marching to defend the revolution in 1792 began to sing Le Marseillaise, the French national anthem, and to wave the new tricolor flag that represented revolutionary France. Both of these were symbols of the new nation, free from autocratic rule and free from the social strictures of the ancien régime. During this time, two types of nationalism emerged, ethnic and civic. Ethnic nationalism is the belief that national identity is based on ethnicity or religion or race, where blood defines membership. The second form is civic nationalism, the belief that loyalty to a common set of political principles or ideals is what defines membership in the nation. These are very different ways of understanding what it means to belong to a nation, and both are prone to misinterpretation, sometimes with tragic results. The ethnic model of nationalism is essentially the European model. It's the model that emerged in the 19th century in the German response to French domination and remains in force in many ways, both positive and negative, into the 21st century. Perhaps its most notable representative was Otto von Bismarck, a conservative Prussian statesman who effectively ruled Germany from the 1860s until 1890. Bismarck engineered a series of wars, culminating with the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71, that unified the German states into a dominant German nation under Prussian leadership. He was a shrewd practitioner of Realpolitik, which we can translate as practical politics, freed of any moral encumbrances, and he skillfully balanced power relationships between the other European nations to maintain Germany's position. Bismarck became a hero to German nationalists. They saw him as the founder of a new Reich, which is the German word for empire. The civic model of nationalism resembles more closely the model that emerged in the United States, and also, to some degree, the model adopted by constitutional democracies in Europe, such as Sweden. These governments are characterized by acceptance of religious pluralism, ethnic diversity, and common democratic principles. Of course, civic nationalism has its own problems and contradictions, as recent elections have shown. As you engage with the readings for this unit, go back to our conceptual starting point, the notion of equality. All of the ideologies that emerged to help shape post-revolutionary societies in Europe and the Americas referred to equality in some manner. Liberalism is founded on equal rights and equal protection of citizens under the law. Conservatism places more emphasis on the importance of tradition and, as a consequence, rejects some notions of social and economic equality. Nationalism emerged as a broader alternative that could accommodate both liberalism and, with time, conservatism. In nationalism, equality is tied to membership in the nation. All those who are part of the nation, whether ethnically or civically, are equal participants in the nation. Rich and poor, young and old, urban and rural, are brought together by the notion of belonging to the same nation. 
This, perhaps, is the reason nationalism continues to exert so much influence among the many nation-states that now populate our planet. In our next unit, we'll examine the role of capitalism in the emergence of industrial society and the social questions it raises. Until then, best wishes.